So now it's quarter past one, and uh, I welcome you to the afternoon session of the first day of our summer school. And it's my pleasure to introduce the first speaker of the afternoon, Chloe Agard Asenkot, an expert at the interface of machine learning and bioinformatics. Um, Chloe did her PhD in computer science at, at UC Irvine, then was a, a postdoctoral research scientist at the Max Planck Institutes in Tübingen, and uh, then moved on to, to Paris, to Min Paris Tech, uh, the Institut Curie and INSERM, where she uh, in 2018 became an assistant professor and is now an associate professor. Uh, Chloe has uh, worked a lot at the, at the, the set interface between, um, between machine learning and, and computational biology. And uh, she has received uh, a number of honors for her work. Like she became an Alexander von Humboldt research fellow during her postdoctoral studies. Um, and she's now even co-president of the community of special interest for machine learning in computational and systems biology, one of the big cozies uh, within the International Society of Computational Biology. She's also very active in, uh, in the Society of Women in Machine Learning and Data Science, where she co-founded the Paris uh, section of this society. And she uh, received an ANR Young, Research, Young Researcher Grant in 2019. I'm very happy to have her here. I was also very happy to have her in my lab uh, doing her postdoctoral studies. And when I read uh, the title of Chloe's talk, I remember the conversation we had 10 years ago about multiple modalities and how we can do machine learning when we have multiple views on the same data. I must admit 10 years back, this was a very hypothetical discussion because we hardly ever had more than one view. But now 10 years later, um, this is absolutely a reality. It also tells you a bit um, about how you can develop algorithms now that might become uh, useful in a decade from now, which is maybe a, like an aspect of, of our field. So I'm very interested to hear your current perspective on this, on this topic, Chloe, and we are very happy to have you here. Um, so thank you, Carson. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be actually talking at uh, one of those machine learning and uh, precision medicine summer school because I was one of the organizers of the first such summer school we had in 2014 and now finally I'm, I'm a speaker. Um, so, so my goal here is, uh, so I have one of those lectures of course, right, not, not invited talks, and so my goal is, is to give you an overview uh, of some machine learning techniques for data integration, uh, giving you an overview of everything would be uh, completely um, uh, out, uh, I mean, it's impossible. There's so many things happening. Um, so yeah, actually <laughs> bouncing back on Carson's remark uh, in his introduction, uh, some of the things I'm going to present are actually uh, a decade old or more um, because uh, what I want to do here is not so much talk about the very latest research uh, in this area, but uh, maybe lay uh, a bit the foundations uh, of some major ideas uh, that are still very relevant today. Um, okay, so the first thing maybe is to clarify what we mean uh, by, so my title had data integration. So what do we mean by data integration or data fusion in a machine learning perspective? Um, the, the idea here is that you have uh, multiple views of the data. Uh, so often nowadays we talk about multiple modalities. Uh, sometimes you'll hear in the bioinformatics film multi-omics. Uh, the idea is that you have several representations of the same data set. So you have your, your learning data set is composed of n samples. Uh, and then instead of having um, just one set of n vectors representing your n samples, you have several such sets. So here I'm representing two of those. Uh, so they don't have to be uh, on coming from the same space. Um, and so the idea is that uh, you want to learn from both these representations at the same time. Uh, so that's what used to be called multi-view machine learning and the deep learning community seems to be insisting on multimodal machine learning. Um, so I'll tend to use both uh, interchangeably. And the assumption here is that those views are complementary. So they're both bringing uh, information uh, and that there's a benefit to be uh, gained from learning from these two representations at the same time, that you're not encoding the same information in two different views. Um, 
Um, okay, so first a few examples of multi-view learning problems. I've actually only picked uh, two examples, but so I could have given an entire lecture on that. Uh, the first one uh, comes from uh, cancer research and multi-omics data. Uh, so this is, uh, I mean, it's, I've picked one paper, you see there's references at the end. Uh, I've picked one such paper, but there are many others based on TCGA data and other uh, cancer data. Where uh, the question is, can you uh, combine data coming from uh, sequencing, so whether exome sequencing, uh, gene expression data, this type of things, uh, data from SNPs, uh, so single nucleotide polymorphisms, methylation data, protein levels, um, so can you uh, combine all those different omics views of the same samples uh, to um, identify uh, disease subtypes, so in a machine learning term this means clustering, uh, and uh, identify which types uh, of, um, uh, of which, I mean, among all your samples, which are the samples that shared uh, common characteristics. Um, another of examples I've picked uh, is a much more recent paper, uh, a multimodal uh, prognosis prediction, prediction also in cancer. Um, what I liked about this example uh, is that uh, this, this idea of combining omics data, clinical data, and um, imaging data. Um, so forget about the details here. Uh, I just wanted to put a, put a picture, uh, so I uh, picked it from the paper. Uh, but this, uh, you'll find a bunch of work on multi-omics, uh, so as on this previous slide, but there's also now more and more work where you incorporate clinical data and um, post-site imaging histopathology data, uh, which I think is, is very interesting because uh, these are um, very different, um, I mean the nature of these different objects is very different. Um, Okay, so those were my two examples uh, to, to help you figure out what it is I'm talking about with this um, uh, multi-view uh, machine learning. And uh, so now a bit of, uh, uh, of uh, classification of, uh, of multi-view machine learning techniques uh, based on uh, the stage of integration. So I'm not the person who came up with this. Uh, it's been around for, for a while. Uh, the idea is that you can uh, do integration uh, of multiple views at different stages. So the first uh, stage is early integration. And the idea of early integration is, merely, is that you're merely going to concatenate the different features uh, to obtain a classical problem, single view problem. So if you have two views, uh, one with uh, P1 features, and the second with P2 features, and you're just like concatenating your vectors, your input vectors, and now you have a single view of P1 plus P2 uh, features. Uh, so the nice thing is that it's really easy to do. I mean, if you know, if you have software that runs uh, machine learning algorithms, uh, you just like input the concatenation of your different views and uh, here you are. Uh, the limitations are <laughs> numerous. Um, one is that uh, you're going to have uh, uh, to think hard about how you're normalizing your data if uh, you have measurements that are on different scales. Uh, what does it mean to give uh, as input to your algorithm uh, numbers that for some of them are gene expression levels and for others are presence or absence of methylation? Uh, so this is a bit just combining apples and oranges, which makes both learning and interpretability difficult. And another limitation is that, I mean, especially if you're talking multi-omics, uh, each of your view is already uh, typically a very high dimensional uh, vector. So you have gene expressions for, I don't know, 20,000 transcripts. Uh, SNPs for, I mean, SNP data, presence absence for uh, a million SNPs, methylation data for, I don't know how many CPG islands. Uh, so if you're just using one of those early integration things, uh, you're making your cursive dimensionality issue um, uh, even stronger than what we already have in single view omics uh, data. Um, okay, so the second family of approaches would be light integration, uh, where uh, uh, you would uh, learn different models on each of your views. 
and uh, then uh, you would combine um, all uh, you would combine the outputs of those views. Uh, so that's maybe not very clear in my notation, but so here I have two views. Uh, so I chose vectors of P1 and P2. So I'm learning one model on the first view, a second model on the second view. And now I have uh, a third function, a third model G that is combining uh, what I've learned with F1 with what I've learned with F2. And uh, you could uh, either use uh, a preset function for G. So if you're doing a regression problem, you could average out your, uh, you could average your outputs. Uh, if you're doing classification, you can use majority vote. Uh, but of course, uh, very often what you're trying to do if you're uh, employing one of those approaches is to learn this function. Uh, so you're going to um, learn first all your models and then learn how to combine them. Uh, so this has, this has the advantage, uh, I mean, this addresses some of the limitations I've listed before for the early integration. Uh, so namely that because you're dealing with each of your views separately to start with, um, you're, um, um, you're, you don't have this problems that I was calling uh, mixing apples and oranges. Uh, and uh, also, your cursor dimensionality is limited to cursor dimensionality on each of your views instead of on the sum of all your views. Uh, and again, uh, it's uh, fairly easy to set up uh, if uh, you have a classical machine learning library. One of the limitations of late integration uh, is that, uh, so if you want to do something a bit smart here in G, um, you're going back to uh, what would be ensemble learning. So you can learn different models uh, and then you want to combine them in a smart way. Uh, and we know that ensemble learning works better if models are uncorrelated. And here, um, of course, I've said the assumption was that uh, your different views were complementary and not encoding the same information. But at the same time, you would expect that they are correlated, right? Um, and this makes, uh, this makes it difficult to benefit from more than one view. Uh, and in my limited experience with this type of problems, uh, with this type of approaches, um, is that if you have one of your models that is performing really well, uh, it's difficult to uh, add more information and make the whole thing perform better. Um, okay. So now I'm coming to what I find as the most interesting uh, type of approaches, um, which is what I'm going to be talking about for the remainder of my talk, uh, which is intermediate uh, integration. Uh, so here's the idea is that really you're going to jointly learn from the two views at the same time uh, with a specific, I mean, a dedicated algorithm that is specific to multi-view um, uh, problems. So I'm really going to learn and in the one uh, in one go a function from the I mean across the different views the from on the over the union of the different views. Um, okay, so from a modeling point of view, it's much more satisfying. Uh, so you're explicitly modeling the fact that you have multiple data sources uh, and. Uh, you can do, I mean, and we'll talk about this. Um, if there's relationships between your different sources, you can model them. Uh, but from a practical point of view, uh, this requires coming up with new algorithms. Uh, and so this makes it uh, more difficult. Um, OK, so that's what we're going to be talking about today. All right, so there's, uh, there's several ideas uh, on how to do um, uh, intermediate uh, data integration, machine learning, uh, multi-view machine learning uh, that I want to talk about. And the first idea, uh, and several families of ideas. The first one is the idea of embedding the data in a common feature space. Uh, so the idea is that you want to take your different views of the data, you want to map them to a single space in which you have a common representation of the data, uh, and then apply a classical machine learning algorithm to this common representation of the data, which is uh, expected to be something uh, more meaningful uh, than just a concatenation um, of the two views. Um, 
Okay, so uh, when I'm talking uh, about embedding the data in a common feature space, uh, what you may, I mean, like maybe the first thing that comes to mind is that you want to find a low dimensional representation of the data uh, that uh, comes from all your different views. Uh, so I think in, yeah, depending on, <laughs> on the slides, I'm only writing two views or I'm writing a capital V views. Uh, but most of what I'm talking about can be generalized if I've written writing it with two views. Uh, so most of what I'm talking about can be generalized to an arbitrary number of views. Um, okay, so what I want to do here is learn a representation of my data. Uh, so I have a certain number of features in each of my input spaces in each of my views, and I want to learn a representation phi uh, of my data in a space uh, whose dimensionality is much smaller um, than the sum of P1 and P2. Um, and the first example uh, of this uh, is joint non-negative matrix vectorization. And uh, so you might know already uh, non-negative matrix vectorization, it's a classical uh, technique um, for uh, dimensionality reduction in machine learning. Uh, so here at the bottom of my, at the top, sorry, of my slide, I'm presenting uh, NMF, so non-negative matrix vectorization for a single view. So here I have a data set. So we're talking here um, about unsupervised machine learning. Um, so I have a single view uh, and samples P dimensions. The idea of NMF is that you're going to want to, you're going to find um, uh, a new representation of the matrix. Here, it's this new representation is called W. Uh, you still have N rows, but you have only D dimensions, and D is much smaller than P. So this is this matrix here. And you're going to find it by decomposing the data matrix in the product of such a matrix W and a matrix H uh, that gives you the correspondence between each of those uh, D dimension and the P dimensions that you already originally had. Uh, so we call non-negative because you're uh, imposing the constraint that all the entries in W and H are positive. Um, and the so formulation of this problem is to find, uh, so if D uh, is set, find W and H uh, so, so as to minimize the forbiddenness norm of the difference between X and WH. Uh, so what this means is merely that uh, you're going to take the sum over uh, the squares of the differences element-wise between your two matrices. Uh, so if w, you want w, uh, to be as close as possible to x element per element. So this is a big family uh, of approaches. Uh, I mean, NMF has been widely studied. Mm. So several algorithms that exist um, that are fairly efficient. Um, there's several variants uh, which you can add uh, constraints to these problems. And so it comes in, in many flavors. And so one of these flavor is a multi-view approach uh, where you want um, to learn a view, so still W, a representation W of your data, d-dimensional, um, but such that uh, you um, have an approximation uh, so that W approximates, sorry, that WH uh, approximates um, each of your views. So that's what I have here. Um, so you could do uh, non-negative matrix factorization on uh, each of your views independently. And then you would have, if you have V views, you would have V representations. But what you're doing here is that you enforce that the representation in the low dimensional representation is the same for all the views. Um, so I'm not going to talk more about this uh, because uh, I think uh, Anais Boudou may talk a bit about it tomorrow. Um, and if you're curious about uh, examples of application of this technique uh, to um, multi omics data, uh, you can check out this review paper here. Uh, by uh, Laura Contini and Anaïs Boudou. Um, and so that was uh, my first approach to learn a lower dimensional representation uh, of 
uh, a date of data from um, from several different views. Uh, so this is the old school type of thing to do, uh, metric sectorization. Uh, nowadays, uh, what you do when you're cool is uh, deep learning. Uh, and uh, so as you probably know, deep learning, you can always see it as learning a representation of the data. So you put whatever number of hidden layer between your input and your output. And the last hidden layer, you can always interpret it as a new representation of your data. Um, and uh, so there's a bunch of approaches that have been developed for deep multi-view learning, uh, where in essence, you're going to put your views, your different views uh, as inputs to the uh, neural network. Uh, but instead, I mean, unlike what you would do um, with, um, uh, I mean, if you were just uh, uh, doing early integration, uh, you will start by, you will, for the first layer or the first few layers, you will connect only, um, you would connect the views to their, sorry, to their own hidden layers uh, and not connect uh, the entire uh, input layer with the entire uh, next hidden layer. So here at this stage, you've learned an intermediate representation of each of your views. And here in blue, you have a global intermediate representation. Um, so. Again, on my drawing, I've only I have only have here one hidden layer uh, specific to each view and one hidden layer that is common to both views. Uh, you could imagine having many more intermediate layers. Um, and you could do that in either supervised or unsupervised ways with feed. So supervised would be just a feed forward architecture with so you would um, and, and unsupervised would be an auto encoder. So when you would want the output to match the input. And the idea is that because here you have uh, a, a single representation at the end, uh, I mean, because, sorry, <laughs> the idea is that the, this architecture will um, start by transforming if you want each of your views so as to make them uh, uh, as amenable as possible to be transformed into uh, a last uh, representation common to both views. Uh, and so typically when you do this, uh, you also use um, your intermediate layers uh, would be of smaller dimensions than your input layers, uh, which is why it's in spirit similar to uh, the NMF. It's also a dimensionality reduction technique. Um, okay. So that was uh, the first point of my first idea, embedding the data in a common feature space. Um, on the other hand, uh, you might want to, if you're working, if you like kernels, uh, you might want to map the data to a higher dimensional, I mean, typically have a space that's higher dimensional than your input data. Um, and that is again, common to uh, that in which a common representation to different views uh, lives. Uh, so here, uh, so I'm talking about Hubble space, I'm talking about kernel methods. So what I'm talking about here is actually about learning a kernel, um, so which is going to uh, um, work on pairs of elements represented by my different views. Uh, and I thought I would uh, insert here a, a little uh, primer on kernel methods, uh, because then I don't know if everybody who's listening today uh, is very familiar with kernels. Um, so the idea of kernel methods uh, is uh, to build nonlinear models uh, by uh, transforming your data, uh, by mapping into a space, a uh, new space that is typically higher dimensional, um, and in this new space, you're going to learn a linear function that's going to be nonlinear in your input space. Uh, so I have here a small example, uh, which is which I like because I don't have to draw a higher dimensional space, uh, which is difficult uh, in uh, if I only have two dimensions uh, on my slides. Uh, so here uh, I have two features. Uh, and I have a model, so you can imagine that it's a decision boundary separating two classes. Uh, this model is nonlinear, but this nonlinear model is actually linear in a different feature space 
uh, that's over x1 square and x2 square. Um, so kernels allow you to uh, generalize this. Uh, Um, in uh, the sense that, uh, so you can use a mapping much more complicated than what I've, I've used here uh, to go from your uh, input space that has p dimension to a new space uh, that has many more dimensions. Uh, and a dot product in the new space um, is uh, simply a kernel over the initial space. So. Uh, my input original input data, a kernel over the input original uh, inputs, just means dot product between the images of x and x prime in the new space. Uh, and why uh, do people like working with kernels? Because of something called a kernel trick uh, that tells you that um, if you have an algorithm in which your input x on your appear in dot products, then you can replace this dot products by a kernel. It's equivalent to mapping the data to a new feature space through this function phi and replacing the dot products between the images of the point x and x prime through phi with the kernel. Uh, so this sounds stupid. It doesn't sound like a trick at all. It just means I've replaced writing this with this. And it's so far, uh, I mean, dot product between phi of x, phi of x prime is the same thing as k of x and x prime. Uh, doesn't look so much like a trick, but it actually is a trick when computing k is easier than computing phi. Um, and you have cases in which actually you can uh, find a k uh, in, which, in situations where you don't have an explicit phi. Um, and even if you're not in such a situation, on the example here with the quadratic kernel, so the, the quadratic mapping uh, was uh, simply um, mapping your p features to themselves plus uh, the pairwise products between all features. Uh, so from x, x1 square, x1, x2, x1, x3, and so on and so forth until you reach xp squares, xp squares. So it's quite a large number of features uh, with some, uh, I mean, I'm, uh, you, you have some um, coefficients uh, to take into account if you want uh, this, Two expressions to match, but taking the images of x and x prime through this function and then uh, applying the dot products is equivalent to taking the dot products in the initial space, adding a constant, and putting everything squared. So this is what we call the quadratic kernel. Uh, and this is a, a situation where you can imagine that it's easier to keep my p features, compute the dot product, add a constant, put multiply by itself rather than first computing all my features. So it's not very interesting for quadratic kernels, but it becomes interesting uh, for, uh, you can imagine, for instance, a higher degree polynomial. Uh, kernels are also uh, interesting in uh, computational biology um, because there's been a bunch of kernels that have been uh, developed for uh, biological data. Uh, and uh, so, um, I'm going just to mention a few examples. Uh, I've put pointers to this if you're interested. Uh, so you have kernels based actually not on uh, represent vector or representation of the data, but just on sequences. Um, and you can use uh, such kernels uh, to build, um, I mean, you can use, sorry, you can build kernels directly over uh, sequences and in particular protein sequences. Uh, you can build kernels based on, uh, on networks. Uh, so whether graph kernels for objects that themselves are, um, uh, can be represented as graphs. So graph kernels for molecules. Uh, or um, if, you, if you have a network on which your nodes are um, uh, the objects uh, that you want to build a kernel on, uh, you can you have things like diffusion kernels uh, that can also uh, give you a kernel directly uh, without first finding a mapping. Uh, we also have kernels for SNPs uh, in, in genome-wide association studies. And all those things are possible because kernels can be interpreted as uh, measures of similarities. So in 
So in order to build a kernel, what you need to do is to build, um, um, is to find uh, some notion of similarity. What does it mean for two objects to be similar? So what does it mean, for instance, for two protein sequences to be similar? Um, and, uh, and then you need, uh, you just need just, sorry, <laughs> just is uh, sometimes difficult. Uh, but if you have something that in terms of meaning can be interpreted as a similarity, and in addition, uh, verifies a number uh, of mathematical properties and you can use it as a kernel. Uh, and the reason why a kernel can be interpreted as a measure of similarity is because it's a dot product. And if you think of dot products uh, in Euclidean space, as a dot product between those two vectors, x and x prime uh, is proportional to the cosine of the angle. Uh, so if the vector are uh, collinear, uh, the dot product is large, the cosine of the angle is one. If those two uh, vectors are orthogonal, uh, the dot, they're very different, uh, the cosine of the angle is zero. Um, okay, so kernels have a long history uh, of being used in bioinformatics. Um, so I think it makes sense to uh, uh, wonder a bit if you're interested in um, integrating um, data in a multi-omics um, context to, um, to wonder about um, the kernel approaches that can be used. Um, and so the idea of uh, here is going to be the idea of multiple kernel learning. Uh, so you have your different omics data and you know from the literature how to build one kernel for each um, of, your, um, of your data types. Um, so each of those mat each of those k's here is actually a matrix uh, of uh, n times size n by n. Uh, so n is again your number of samples and each entry of this matrix is the kernel function applied to sample i and sample l so it's a dot product between sample i and sample l but in this uh, high dimensional halo space um, so some a sum of kernel uh, is the kernel uh, so you can build a multi-view kernel that is the sum of uh, so linear combinations of those different kernels. And you know that if, because you know it's a kernel, you know that there exists a Hilbert space and a mapping from your input data to this Hilbert space such that uh, this kernel is a dot product over this Hilbert space, which means that you can use any uh, kernel algorithms, uh, kernel based message uh, with this linear combination of kernels. Uh, so now I've been uh, haven't said much about this coefficient here in the linear combination. Uh, so one of the things you can do is normalize your kernel matrices so that they all have one on the diagonals and just take the sum. But actually, there's something interesting in the case of support vector machines uh, is that you can also learn ideal uh, value um, optimal values for this um, for this coefficients. Uh, so here I've written the dual formulation of uh, support vector machines. Um, if you're, uh, so if you're not very familiar with uh, SVMs, um, so this is one of the formulations, uh, one of the ways of, form, uh, of uh, formulating uh, the optimization problems that uh, when you solve it, uh, gives you an SVM decision function. Um, so what it's doing is that it's learning uh, a function that is um, uh, for, so the decision function is going to be a linear combination of the product between the labels uh, of the samples from the data set and the kernels between a new sample, the one you're trying to label and samples from the data set. Um, and uh, so, uh, and one thing that's uh, also important to note is that we know how to solve uh, this problem efficiently and uh, exactly. So um, one thing we also know uh, from uh, the theory of SVMs is that, uh, so here what you're trying to do is find those coefficient alpha of the linear co combination. Uh, but we also know that 
uh, you have the better performance when this function here that you're trying to maximize is smaller. So I'm solving this problem. I have a certain uh, performance. If I have other data points and I have, uh, I'm solving this problem and I'm obtaining a model that has a smaller minimum, uh, then my second model is going to be performing better than the first one. Uh, which means that we know uh, how to optimize the kernel while learning uh, by uh, looking, so here, all what I've done is that I've replaced this kernel here um, by uh, my multiple kernel, my linear combination of the kernels of the different views. Um, and I can replace, uh, and I can, I know that I want this whole thing to be minimal. So I'm going to look for the values here of the coefficients mu of the linear combinations that minimize the overall um, optimum. Uh, so this is ideas that have been proposed uh, quite a while ago now, almost 20 years ago. Um, and uh, so maybe to, to summarize, uh, what we're doing here is that we start from a kernel on each of our different views, and then we can learn a linear combination of those kernels that is optimal at the same time as we're learning an SVM that uses this kernel uh, to make its decision. Okay, so uh, in, in the two, I mean, the, I've presented you so far approaches for intermediate uh, integration in multi-view machine learning. Uh, where the idea was um, to um, map all the different views onto a common subspace and then learn a function on the subspace. A second uh, family of ideas would be to learn different models on each view, but at the same time, uh, force them to match. So uh, what I'm talking about here is that um, if I have my, my two views, uh, so one on a space of dimension P1 and a second on a space of dimension P2, I'm going to learn two models, F1 and F2. Um, and, um, and, but unlike what I was doing in the late integration, now I want to learn them. And at the same time as I learn them, I want to enforce that those two models make they agree that they make similar predictions. Um, and then in the end, uh, I can build a final model uh, that is a simple combination. Uh, so average or weighted average or majority vote um, of, um, of those different view specific models. One of the nice advantages of this type of uh, integration is that um, in the end, because you obtain one model per view, you're able to make predictions uh, if you're in a supervised setting um, or cluster points, integrate points if you're in a clustering application, for instance, even if one of your views is missing. Uh, so those approaches are, are particularly suited uh, to, um, to, to problems where you might uh, not have um, all your different types of data available to you at prediction time, uh, which I think makes a lot of sense uh, in uh, multi-omics settings. Um, you might have uh, a bunch of different type of information at learning stage, uh, all like gene expression, methylation data, mutation uh, data, and so on and so forth. But you want to be able to make predictions, even if one of those modalities is missing, uh, whether because no one ever acquired it or because there's some quality control issue on, issue on it. Uh, so I think those approaches are, are particularly interesting for, for this uh, reason. Um, and here I want to talk about, uh, again, uh, two major ideas. Uh, one is CCA. And the other is uh, to um, impose these agreements uh, through regularization. Um, okay, so CCA is really old technique, uh, uh, Hotelling 1936, it's almost 100 years old. Um, the idea is that you want to find basis vectors, so uh, uh, vectors uh, um, of new space on which you're going to project your data. 
so as to maximize the correlation between the proje projections of two views. Um, so this is, here's a, the problem uh, you want to solve. Uh, so I want that if I project view one over vector one, W1, and I project view two over uh, vector W2, then the uh, um, dot product here uh, between those two projections is maximum. And I can impose some constraint uh, that uh, um, uh, just uh, to uh, have a single a unique solution to the problem. Uh, so it's a bit similar in spirit to PCA, where you want to find directions on which to project your data so as to maximize its variance. But here you have two views, and you want to project each of them on uh, have a new representation for each of them in such a way that they're maximally correlated in the new space. Uh, another way to look at it, uh, I mean, the two formulations are equivalent is that you want to minimize the disagreement between the projections. So here is, again, I'm projecting um, data one, uh, data x1, my view, my first view, sorry, on w1. I'm projecting my second view on w2. Uh, and uh, I want the difference between those two to be minimal. Uh, so this naturally extends uh, to more than two views. And there's many extensions of CCAs, I mean, because it's been around for so long, uh, including uh, uh, using kernels. This is multi-view extensions. You have Kettering in 71. Uh, you have uh, a bunch of work uh, on, on CCA. Um, so here again, with CCA, we're talking about dimensionality reduction, and each of your view is going to be sent to different representations. So keep that, keep, just keep that in mind. Um, it's just that those different representations are going to agree uh, among themselves. Um, OK, so it's not exactly this idea of, I mean, it's exactly this idea of learning different models on the different views and making them agree uh, among themselves. Um, but in a supervised setup, you're still miss missing one step. Uh, how do I go, go from having those different representations uh, that are still one representation per view uh, to having a single unified uh, model um, on top of those views? Uh, and the answer for that is typically through regularization. Um, so, um, So here's the idea is, uh, I mean, I hope uh, you, you're familiar with the idea of regularization, uh, just um, to, to explain it uh, in a few words. Um, this is, so here I'm in the supervised learning setup uh, and supervised learning is typically uh, empirical risk minimization, which means that uh, I define myself a family of models, so capital F, and I'm looking for the model in this family that minimizes the empirical risk. And the empirical risk is simply the average error that uh, my model is performing uh, on this data set. So here, L is a loss function. So L of yi, fv of xi is the error that I'm make, making by uh, predicting f of x instead of y. So when the true label is y. Um, and so all the surprise machine learning algorithms, you know, almost all fall under this uh, setup, uh, provided you add a regularization term. Uh, sorry, I don't know why it says loss risk here. It should be, um, it should be regularization. A typical regularization function is the alter norm of a weight vector of a, co of a regression coefficient, for instance. Uh, so ridge regression enters this framework, SVMs enter this framework. Um, and uh, so that's what you can do view per view. Um, and so regularizers uh, can also be used to tie the different views together. Uh, so here you have in black, the exact same thing as uh, before. So for each of your different views. So if I was only solving, uh, finding uh, the minimum over the sum for these different views of my empirical, empirical risk with uh, view-specific regularizer, it would be equivalent to finding, to finding v different models and learning them independently from each other. 
Uh, but I can add uh, additional regularizer uh, over the consensus. So that's going to encourage my B different solutions to be uh, similar to each other. Uh, so there's many examples of that. Uh, one of them is on the SVM. Uh, so an approach uh, from 2005-2006 that's called SVM2K. Um, so um, if I go back to the primal formulation of the SVM, uh, this is the problem you're trying to solve. So you're minimizing, uh, you're trying to, you're looking for a weight vector. Uh, so I'm not using kernels here. Here you're looking for a weight vector W uh, that, is, uh, in, that is um, such that uh, you minimize the sum of a regularization term L2 norm plus the sum of slack variables. Those slack variables are the errors each of your that you're making on each of your samples. Uh, so the prediction function is Wx plus b. The true label is y. Um, and uh, the slack tells you how far you are from having y times Wx plus b greater than 1. Um, and what SVM2K is doing is uh, repeating this problem. So here you have it. For the first u, if I'm solving, if I'm minimizing this, I'm uh, finding an SVM over my first view. If I'm minimizing this, I'm minimizing, I'm finding an SVM over my second view. Uh, and what we're doing with SVM2K is add a constraint here uh, that is the consensus. So those eta i uh, are small uh, when the two views agree in their prediction. Uh, and so here you have a number of constraints that are, uh, the, again, those constraints here for the first view and for the second view. And in orange, I've highlighted uh, the constraints that tells you that the two views should uh, agree. And then in the end, your prediction, your final prediction is just uh, the average of the two predictions. And of course, this extends to more than two views. Um, so that's the first example. Uh, you can also do that with lasso type of approaches. Uh, so lasso is uh, an empirical risk minimization on the linear model. Uh, again, uh, so here I wrote it for a quadratic, for sorry, for a regression problem. So I'm using the quadratic error. Uh, I have an L1 norm here regularizing uh, my uh, regression coefficient. Uh, and uh, one way you can tie together several lassos on different views uh, is what I've written here. Um, so uh, here in black, uh, you have uh, um, the same thing as, uh, as before, so learning on your V views separately. And then you're using uh, what's in orange to tie your views together. Uh, so you're using this uh, uh, matrix MIV. So MIV is a contribution of uh, view V to label I, so, so to the label of sample I in your training set. Um, and you want this uh, the whole matrix M uh, to be a sparse and low rank. And this is what's going to tie your different uh, models together. And in the end, uh, so you have learned that your final model, it's a linear combination of uh, the models you've learned, on, you've learned on each view. And the coefficient for this linear model, uh, it depends. Uh, I mean, it's sort of an average of those, uh, of those coefficients, those contributions um, of the different views to the different labels. Uh, you could imagine uh, different uh, regularizers that would tie your views together. Uh, actually, I've, I mean, I had one in mind, and then I looked for a reference for it in the literature, and I couldn't find it. So I don't know if I'm the only person who thought about it. I don't probably unlikely. Uh, maybe I wasn't good at searching the literature, or maybe it actually doesn't work in practice. Um, but that's uh, uh, that's one of the ways uh, you can tie together several lessons. And you can apply this uh, approach uh, to NMF as well. So um, in the, uh, um, so I had presented you NMF for single view earlier on, uh, 
And then I told you if you do joint NMF uh, by uh, um, looking for a same matrix W um, that would be common to your different NMFs for each of the different views. Uh, but what you can also do is allow yourself to have a different projection, a different WV for each of the views. Uh, but then you want to use a regularizer to tie together uh, that those different matrices here, uh, they are not too different from each other. Uh, so again, a regularization approach. Okay. Mm. All right. So I've already talked about two of my favorite things in machine learning, which is which are kernels and uh, and regularization. Uh, the one thing I haven't talked about so far is graphs, uh, and uh, so that's uh, what I want to be talking about now. Is how um, people have been using graphs um, to um, to do multi-view machine learning. Um, okay, so first, uh, a small recap on graphs. So you can use graphs to model relationships between entities. Uh, so a graph is a set of vertices and edges, um, and the edges are pairs of vertices. Uh, so here you have a graphical representation of a graph. Uh, so it has here nine vertices uh, and a number of edges I haven't counted. Um, and you can also represent a graph by a matrix uh, so it's called an adjacency matrix. I mean, one by several types of matrices actually, but right here as uh, the adjacency matrix is one of the most common ways of doing that. Uh, so you have as many lines, so it's square matrix, you have as many lines and columns as you have nodes or vertices in your graph. And each entry of this matrix is uh, non-zero if, if and only if. Uh, there is an edge uh, between the two vertices. So here, there's an edge between the first and the third vertex vertices. So there is uh, a one at position one, three in my matrix. There's a bunch of variants on this idea. Uh, one of them is that instead of having ones and zeros, you can have weights over the edges. So here you would write, you would write weights, so labels on the edges. And inside the adjacency matrix, instead of the, just being a binary matrix, you would have um, uh, you would have real value numbers, uh, and you can also orient the edges. Uh, so you would have arrows on the uh, on the edges, and then the adjacency matrix wouldn't be symmetric and symmetric anymore. So having an edge from V one to V three wouldn't be the same as having an edge from V three to V one. And graphs has been used a lot, uh, in particular in bioinformatics, to represent uh, two things. First, knowledge, prior knowledge that you have about relationships between entities. And uh, so maybe one of the most classical examples in biology is biological pathways. So your nodes would be edges. The so relationships tell you that um, those uh, the edges tell you that those uh, genes um, belong to the same pathway or work together towards uh, achieving a biological function. And you can also build graphs uh, from any data. You can always build a graph uh, as a matrix of similarity. Um, so your adjacency matrix would be a similarity matrix. You could threshold it and say, if you want it binary, uh, so you compute similarities, I don't know, you use dot product and you feed in space, for instance, on your input data. Um, and uh, then you would have, okay, those feature one and feature three, they're similar. Uh, the similarity is above, above a certain threshold. So I put one here, I put an edge between them. Uh, feature one and feature two, there aren't, so I don't put any edge between them. Okay. So graphs. Graphs can be used to represent a relationship between samples. So you would have each of the different views gives you a different adjacency matrix um, for a, uh, and uh, which is so n by n uh, matrix. So each of your views if you different graph, but with the same nodes. And then um, uh, supervised learning can be seen as a node labeling problem. Uh, so what if 
I have some of the labels for some of this edge for some of those nodes. How do I learn the labels for the missing nodes? Not going to talk about this because I think Anais uh, will talk about it tomorrow. Uh, what I want to talk about is the idea of using graphs to tie views together in the context when features from each view can be uh, mapped to a single vertex in the graph. So let me clarify uh, what I think about that. Um, so um, when you're working with omics data in particular, uh, you can very often match your different omics features to genes. Uh, so if, you're, um, if your features are an RNA transcripts on the one side and protein levels on the other side, uh, of course you know how to map those to the same gene. Uh, you can also do this with SNPs, uh, and I'm mentioning, I'm mentioning this here. Uh, this is something uh, we've been exploring uh, because it's a MLFPM work. It's something we've been exploring in the context of GWIS uh, with uh, uh, Christelle and Jen, uh, so Crystal Benstein and Jen Duro. Um, uh, how do maps uh, SNPs to genes? And the main idea is that uh, um, you map SNPs to gene based on positions on the DNA sequence, uh, but also you can map SNPs to genes based on known uh, regulatory information. So you know that this SNP regulates the expression of this gene, so you map it. Um, and also proximity, not on the sequence, but in 3D space, uh, which is, should also encode some uh, regulatory information. So then what this means is that uh, you have your graph, um, which comes, for instance, from prior knowledge, like biological networks, uh, let's say protein-protein uh, interaction networks. Um, and then, so each, this is a graph of your features. Uh, each node, each vertex is a feature. Um, and then each of the views, is uh, a label of this node. So you can have one, you can see this as you have one graph per view, same graph structure for the different views, um, but different uh, um, feature values for each view and for each sample. Uh, so that what I've tried to represent here uh, for one view uh, is that I have a graph structure here that is common to everyone, uh, but sample I uh, has a different label for each node. For I mean, sample I here has a different label for this node, which is the second gene, as uh, a different sample, so sample L would have. Um, and now uh, there are several things you can do with such a representation. Um, one would be to say, okay, so I have now one, each of my samples is represented by a graph or several graphs, um, one per view. Um, and I know how to build kernels on graphs. So I can use graph kernels to build one kernel per view uh, and apply multiple kernel approaches. Uh, and so one uh, successful approach uh, for this uh, is called PAMOC. Uh, it's pathway multiomics graph kernel based approach. And it does, I mean, <laughs> I've summarized it in one sentence, uh, but this is what it does. So each of your sample is a different set of labels over this graph. You use graph, graph kernels that don't care so much about the structure of the graph, but uh, care about the labels of the nodes. Uh, and then you can use those to uh, uh, build kernels over uh, each of the views um, uh, of your data. Um, I think Crystal uh, will also talk about some uh, examples in this, uh, in this field uh, tomorrow. Uh, so what I want to talk about now is how to use graph regularization to guide feature selection with such approaches. Uh, so I'm cheating a bit, a bit here uh, because I'm actually not in a multi-view uh, framework anymore. Um, I mean, we could discuss uh, how to extend those idea to multi-views uh, learning, but uh, to the best of my knowledge, it hasn't been done yet. Um, and so I'm going to cheat and say that you have a graph that you've built from uh, one or several of your views uh, and that you want to use this um, to select uh, features based on uh, another of those views. 
Um, so there's several, uh, uh, so if I come back to my picture here, now the thing is that I want to use this uh, data representation to learn a model uh, in such a, and I want to learn which of those nodes are important for my output. Um, so there are several type families of approaches you can take, but they're all based on regularizations. I mean, all those I want to talk about. Um, and uh, so uh, there's several proposals for this that have been, that have been built uh, on the lasso. Uh, so you want to use a lasso to encourage sparsity. This is the feature selection part. Uh, and then you want to use a graph to build a regularizer that encourages connected features to have similar weight. And so this is again your classical lasso formulation. Um, here's this is a regularization parameter for the sparsity. And now you're adding this additional regularizer. Uh, so there's two examples of this regularizer as a generalized fused lasso proposed uh, by Tip Shirani um, and others in 2005, uh, where here uh, this regularizer is a constraint uh, over the absolute difference between the regression coefficients um, on uh, regression coefficients that are connected, that correspond to features that are correct, connected by an edge. So what this using this regularizer does is encouraging that two features that um, are connected on your network, they get similar weights. The network constraint lasso also does that in a slightly different way. Uh, it uses a Laplacian regularization. Uh, I'm not going to get into the details for today. But it's a very similar idea. Uh, it's going to use the square difference between the, the square of the difference between the coefficient instead of the absolute uh, difference. In that uh, setup, you also have uh, um, other type of approaches uh, when you're really focusing on selection. Uh, and when you start by computing the relevance uh, for each feature. So if I go back to my little drawing here. Uh, I've used my n samples to compute for each of those nodes a relevance. So this can be correlation between the feature and the outcome. It can be based on the statistical test. It can be a nonlinear measure of independence like HSIC. Uh, and now I will use the graph to select few features with higher relevance that are connected on the graph. Uh, so these are approaches uh, that have been explored. Uh, in particular, in the previous iteration of this uh, ITN, so I thought it was historically relevant as well. Um, and the formulation is very similar to that of the lasso. Instead of minimizing an error term, a risk, you're maximizing a relevance under some constraints. And so one of the constraints uh, is on the size of the number of features you're selecting. So uh, you want to make sure that this the size of the set S, which is your set of selected features, is small. And then you have a constraint on the graph. And so we have two variants of that. Uh, the one we proposed with Karsten and others uh, in 2013, uh, where this graph constraint looks like the, the graph Laplacian uh, constraint of, uh, of the network connected lasso, uh, where this constraint, uh, you're going to penalize having uh, disconnected solutions. So what I mean by that is that every time you have an edge between a feature that is selected and a feature that is not selected, uh, this is going to uh, uh, decrease uh, your um, you, the term you want to uh, maximize. Uh, and uh, then a few years later, uh, um, in collaboration uh, with the lab of uh, Florence de Menet, uh, the lab of Karsten proposed uh, SIGMOD, uh, which has a slightly different penalty, which instead of penalizing disconnected solutions, encourages uh, connected solutions. Okay, I'm almost uh, done with uh, my overviews of these ideas, but I think it's very interesting to think about um, um, using uh, prior knowledge to tie together different views in omics data. Um, and so I've shown you how this can be done with graphs, uh, but this can also be done. I mean, you're going to tell me that it's, it's a form of graph as well. Uh, you can also do this uh, in, in deep learning um, by building knowledge inform your network architectures. 
Uh, so this, thing, this is something that is sometimes called visible ML, uh, visible machine learning. I don't like it so much because it really applies to deep learning. So, um, so I, I, I'd rather call that knowledge informed deep learning uh, architectures. The idea here is that instead of building a classical feed forward, fully connected uh, architecture over your neural network, um, you're going to uh, connect different layers. I mean, you're going to give biological meaning to each of your intermediate levels, each of your hidden layers. Uh, so for instance, if your input features are genes, um, then you can have at the next hidden layers, you're only going to connect to the next hidden layers to you're going to connect together uh, genes that belong to the same complexes. And then you're only going to build connections between the different complexes that belong to the same pathways. Um, and so this is one example. There's many variations on this idea. Uh, the idea here is really that instead of having something fully connected uh, with like no, uh, I mean, just uh, out of the box uh, architecture, you only make connections between things that make sense to you, uh, between features that for you, it makes sense to connect based on prior knowledge. Um, and uh, um, and uh, this um, allows you to um, reduce uh, your hypothesis space or reduce the number of possibilities for models that you're learning. Um, it's tying together things that features that uh, have meaning together. Uh, and I think uh, it's also one of the ways uh, to address this uh, curse of dimensionality that is playing us in bioinformatics. I'm also mentioning that uh, Pelin, who is one of the fellows of the current ITN, uh, working with Joaquin Do Paso, as far as I know, uh, has been working on similar ideas uh, uh, during her PhD. All right, so I'm almost at the end uh, of what I wanted to uh, show you today. Um, and uh, the last thing I want to talk about is uh, feature selection and interpretability. So um, a few of the methods I've talked about were focused on uh, feature selection, but uh, one of the limitations of those all those approaches I've, I mean, of several of the approaches I've presented that is that it's difficult to get anything explainable, interpretable out of it, and to know which are the relevant features from your input, for, I mean, from your uh, inputs or from your data, uh, what is really driving your algorithm. Uh, and we have many, many uh, opportunities in uh, bioinformatics to wish for interpretable models. Uh, so that's what I've tried to represent here is that we have two views and there are many features in each of those views, but I'd like to find out in each of the views which are uh, the important features. Uh, so I actually just jotted, all of, jotted down a few ideas here. Uh, of course, the first thing you can do uh, is that if you're doing early or late integration, uh, you can um, apply a single view uh, feature selection techniques. So anything you can think of from using sparse, from learning sparse models to using feature importance random forest, using SHAP or LIME uh, and so on and so forth, uh, using attention if you're using deep learning, all of this applies uh, to uh, your early or late integration technique, but you don't benefit uh, from joint learning. Uh, so, yes, the only answer I have to that is that a number of those multi-view algorithms I've talked about, so some of those were already, had already spotted it built in, uh, like this weird, I mean, this fancy lasso or the graph-based methods um, uh, where, where nodes are features, so those were, uh, so graph-guided uh, feature selection, but also, for instance, for NMF or for CCA, uh, you have sparse variants. Uh, that allow you to, um, uh, to build uh, so sparse models that are only using part of the features. Uh, of course, here, uh, you'll, for all those approaches, uh, you have this issue that um, so sparsity he here is achieved uh, with uh, L1 regularization. And L1 regularization is pretty unstable. So if you have many correlated features to start with, um, 
your L1 regularizer is going to select, uh, I mean, it's not going to be stable in the sense that if you have small variations in your input data, so you remove one sample, you run it on a different day on a different machine, this type of things, you get different sets of explanatory features in the end. Um, and so it's a bunch of uh, approaches that try to address this in particular, that is also one of the reasons for developing all those graph-based feature selection approaches um, to in order to try and stabilize this. Um, but we're still not as uh, something um, ideal. Um, so those were my concluding words. Uh, I will share uh, my screens with all the references uh, which are coming, uh, which are the last slides of the talks. Um, but now I've been talking for a very long time and uh, I'd like you to ask me questions. Thank you very much, Chloe, for this excellent talk on, on data integration. Uh, you got a very holistic overview about the various approaches that exist. I, I'm sure that there will be questions. Um, let us start with uh, Dian. Uh, thank you very much for this presentation. It's going to be uh, very useful to me in the near future, so I'm extremely happy to have the possibility to attend this uh, lecture. Uh, my question is, uh, do you have any uh, recommendation when performing data integration with one of the data type being uh, images? Uh, and especially, are there some graph-based methods that are part particularly relevant or, or commonly used uh, for the type of data? Um, okay, so I, I, this is something I know very little about. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I know that there's deep learning approaches that have uh, that have been um, uh, trying to address this, and there's in particular, um, I think it's this paper. Uh, so I can send you the reference <laughs> later on. It's called Page P A G E. It's not really easy to look for a paper called Page uh, <laughs> on Google Scholar. <laughs> um, where they what they're doing uh, is. I mean, it's this idea of no knowledge from neural network architecture, and they combine combining this with uh, the multi-view deep learning I was showing before. So they have this on the one hand, and then they have a different input that would be uh, that comes from whole slide images, and a classical. I mean, what now passes for classical for deep learning on um, uh, on whole slide images um, network here, and in the end, it joins the, the different views. Um, I think that, so, yeah, I don't know. So this is not, this isn't particularly tying together the different uh, information, right, between the omics and the images. Uh, people in spatial transcriptomics have been trying to do this, uh, but I'm, uh, I, I'm not really aware of a particular reference here. I'm going to look at these papers. Thank you very much. Sure thing. Thank you, Diane and Chloe. Giovanni is next. Hi, thank you for the talk. I Hi. really appreciated it. Um, I have a quick question. I hope it's not something that I missed from the talk. So my question is, um, for many complicated models like something uh, like neural networks, they're often trained with gradient descent or some similar optimizers. But a lot of the constraints that you mentioned in some of the models you presented are not differentiable. Like I remember there is the rank of a matrix in one of the um, one yeah. of the models that you presented. Is there any general way to try to, um, to to overcome this challenge if we want to use these more interesting constraints for some model that can only really be optimized with gradient descent? Or, uh, um, they're, they're typically optimized with gradient descent. So, I mean, it's just, so for instance, the L1 constraint is not differentiable, but you pretend it is uh, because it's convex and it has only one point of non differentiation. I would look into um, how, I mean, this uh, using rank constraints on lassos, uh, it's, uh, it's a fairly common thing to do. Uh, I would look specifically at how it, those problems are being solved. Uh, and I'm pretty sure you can translate this to, to a neural network approach. But it was not something I had talked about. And okay. I would Thank also you. not be offended <laughs> if you had missed one second of information in all what I've just delivered. Thank you. 
Are there further questions for Chloe? I have one question. Um, oh no, Pelin is has a one. Yes, Pelin says she has problems with her mic and would like to put it in writing. Yes, that's no problem at all. I'll read it out, the question. So Pelin is asking, thank you for the talk. It was very informative for my side. My question is related to a deep multi-view learning on slide 12. May I learn what is the difference if we first combine multi-views and obtain the encoding information by using autoencoder rather than getting the combination of each last hidden layers of each model of each view. So are you talking about like, why would there's a difference between this and just concatenating the different views? Or did I miss something? Yes, yes. So yeah. really confirm that this is a, the answer to your question is yes. Yeah. Okay, uh, so um, I think the difference is that having those intermediate layers that are specific to each view allow you to uh, um, address uh, this limitation that was uh, talking about, about combining apples and oranges. Um, as you see, those diff different views, they don't live in the same, you know, they're not in comparable scales of this type of things. Um, I think having first some layers that are specific to each view uh, and then something that's global uh, allows you to um, sort of first homogenize the data in the different views and then learn something uh, something global. I hope this answers the question. Yes, thanks. She says yes and thanks. Okay, thank Great. you. Okay. So my question is the following. Um, we talked this morning a bit about confounders in Magnus's talk and this whole field of data integration could also, well, on one hand it benefits, may benefit the study, on the other hand, the more sources you integrate, the more the more risks there are that you integrate some confounding or that, that there is some systematic difference between data views or data sources that um, introduce some signal into your joint data set, which is not biological, but somehow technical or, or yeah. confounding uh, related. So um, do you see or do you know methods that address this problem or do you think this could be a line of future work in this in this field or how would you go about this kind of um, confounding risk in data integration? Um, so this is a very interesting question and uh, I'm, I'm actually not entirely sure that you have more risk of confounding uh, here, I mean, with multiple views than in, uh, in single views. Um, would actually tend to hope that uh, some of the technical biases, uh, if you don't have the same technical biases in different views, and they maybe or hopefully you might um, have things that compensate uh, each other, or maybe it's even worse because if you've acquired your different, I mean, different data differently across different views, then it's just you're only going to learn technical bias. I'm not sure. I don't know if there's something specific to multi-view to do, or if it's just the same problem as was when you treat uh, each view uh, independently from each other. Um, yeah, I don't have an answer to your question, but I'm not. I'm not familiar with any any work that would be specific to uh, confounders in multi-view learning. But I'm also not. You know, I'm. I mean, I'm not familiar with it, but it might exist, right? No, I agree. I mean, there's not really, uh, so I'm also not aware of work that is specific to the multi-view um, setting. I mean, there's a lot for the, for the single view. Yeah, yeah. Maybe but I'm not sure if there's anything. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if there's anything about the multi-view that would allow you to address it in a different way than in the different single views. I think maybe could, some of the algorithms that yeah. address it on single views would need to be ported to multi-view. Yeah, I think one has to think carefully about how related these confounders then would be about yes, exactly. uh, in the different views and if they come if they like cancel each other out or if if they only exist in one view i think it depends very much on yeah on this. or they just accumulate because they exist in all views yeah exactly definitely okay thank you sure are, there are there first further questions for chloe uh, can i just jump into this discussion? Volker, please um so I'm a little bit confused. Um, I mean, confounding happens when you leave out something. I mean, I mean, that's the typical case. And the ones where you add too much inputs, I mean, that can happen, but isn't that 
extremely rare. I mean, it's one of these uh, uh, Perl's conditions uh, vector or something. Uh, or from, no, uh, yeah, one of these uh, strange things that you suddenly introduce dependencies which aren't there if you exclude this variable. But I mean, typically the, 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 the issue, of, in my understanding, is that it's confounding. If you leave them out and you have a hidden confounder, that's the problem. If you uh, assume too many inputs, I mean, that might not be nice and eventually also, of course, might not uh, be very helpful uh, from, for many statistical reasons, but uh, it's not, I mean, my understanding would be that that is not the big issue, but maybe I misunderstand something. Well, I think it depends because if, you, I mean, if your confounding is due to you're missing biological information, then of course, if you add it, if you had multiple views and you add more information, it helped. But if your confounding is like due to technical biases, um, okay, maybe I don't understand. So imagine you've like measured, you have, you're trying to like cluster, uh, you, you're trying to cluster different samples from cancer patients and, uh, all your different views have been uh, uh, acquired in two different uh, um, clinics, I mean, two different labs. And so actually what's the major difference between all those samples is whether they've been measured in lab one or in lab two. Yeah, um, then you should uh, include the identifier for the lab and then you remove the- code. Right, so yeah, that's the thing. So if you, if you use one, if you use what, I mean, in this case, clearly, if you incorporate this information, whether it's single view or multi view, you should be able to address it. But if you've forgotten to include it, uh, yeah, that's the thing. If you forget to include it, then you have a problem. Exactly. There's a problem with confounders, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's forgetting to include them. Well, another example to talk about would be uh, if you have a genetic data set and you now start adding another population to that uh, data set where the phenotypic, um, where the, where the phenotypic ratio is a bit different. You have more cases of a particular phenotype, then th this phenotype may start to correlate with this, um, with the membership of in this uh, additional cohort in this uh, of a different geographic origin. And this is a very, uh, I, this is a very typical problem in, in genetics. Yeah. That you have this kind of population structure and then data integration actually harms because the, the new data source correlates with the phenotype then. And, and no, I mean, can't... Uh, but it's the same thing, right? If you include, uh, if you include features that capture population structure or you do anything, any other of those population structure correction approaches and exactly. you should be okay. And if you don't do it on the single views, it's also bad for the single view approach, so. Exactly. I think we agree probably, but uh, uh, it was just against my intuition that you said too many inputs can be harmful. I mean, they can be in some odd ways, but uh, uh, in most cases, I mean, I, I think the, yeah. the, 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 the simple, I mean, what Ruben uh, uh, Bird sometimes criticizes is uh, take us, I mean, more, more inputs cannot hurt, no? which of course is not quite true in this extreme way view. But the, the more dangerous thing, I think, is to leave something out. Which For sure. My logic would be, if I may, um, uh, um, so my logic would be that the more you measure, the higher the risk that the device that you are using to measure it introduces uh, confounding. That, that then uh, the measurements yeah. correlate, or that the, so that, that the measurements start correlating or, or create correlations between the, the device it was measured on and the, and the phenotype. And because different views are not, the, the different views are not um, me or measured with, with the same machine. Again, we see this in medical data all the time. If there's an upgrade to a machine in a hospital, then the, the measurements start changing. So if there's, a, if there's a slight difference in class ratios before and after the upgrade of the machine, then the machine um, correlates with the phenotype, for example, the machine version in that case. Yeah, yeah but the, the trivial solution, which is probably not a good solution, is to include the identifier of your device. Uh, Absolutely, but if this, so, but it's often uh, difficult to do this in a holistic, holistic and, and uh, systematic way. So the often, often one misses then this, the crucial thing that has changed. Maybe sometimes it may be just a software update of the machine that measured one view, and then you have a 
and then you have yeah. a confounder you didn't uh, notice yeah of course also what you mentioned i mean one solution to confounding i mean one is to include the input or the other one is to do stratification or to do separately yeah and also remove yeah but all those techniques are not particularly multi-view specific right no. it's just yes yeah, maybe yeah. the danger becomes yeah, whatever. Yeah. no probably not okay. i guess you could apply a multi-view clustering techniques and then see what are, if your clusters seem to you to have more to do with biology or with some technical artifacts? Good. Thank you. Then we send a round of applause to you, Chloe, for this for this lecture. That was wonderful. We have a 20-minute break now until we continue with uh, Katrin Röder's talk at three. Thank you, Chloe. Thank you. See you all after sharing. a short break. <laughs>